Welcome. I'm glad glad you guys are here. Let's um, we just we drop right into the action around here. So uh, here's the here's the first question. This one's for Denise. Um, so I I dug up this quote here from uh, from Greg McHale, who of course is uh, Denise's husband. Uh, they're both on the on the line with us. And uh, here's what Greg said uh, sometime not too long ago. He said. He said, nobody gives a shit about whether you drop 20 pounds or you don't. One thing I do know is that you can't take care of the people around you if you don't take care of your health. And, uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, well, Greg, can you verify? Do those sound like your words? I, th I think it sounds like you. <laughs> um, I, I cannot neither confirm or deny, but they absolutely sound like they could be my words. Okay. So it sounds like something Greg would have said, and, and I think it does too. I mean, I heard him say it, it was recorded, but, uh, you know, G Greg, Greg here is, uh, you know, kind of a hard ass guy from, up in the up in the Yukon, he he's got this uh, persona of being outside and training and fitness. And you see these videos of him online, and he looks really strong and stuff. Um, but my question to you, Denise, you know, since you're the one who's there with him day in and day out, is how much time did Greg spend this winter sitting on the couch watching Cobra Kai with a forever puppy on his lap? Like, would you say, is this hours? Is it days? Do you watch, you know, what do you, what do you think? What's your best estimate, Denise? I mean, it's hours a day. It's hard to get him motivated, you know. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we did have a little addiction to Cobra Kai and thank goodness there's only two seasons because it's definitely cuts down on the productivity. So we got it. We're done with it. And uh, yeah, we're back. We're back to it again. <laughs> All righty. Thanks. Thanks, Trav. I really appreciate that one. Like literally you picked up on the one thing that we would, I would consider was our weakness all last winter. We all the real, but where we actually sat in front of the television. Well, the one thing that you would probably not be like, I watch Cobra Kai. <laughs> what is, yeah, what is that? Can, by any means. <laughs> what is that? A Canadian uh, TV show or something? No, Mark. It's um, it was a movie in I think it would have been the late eighties, wouldn't it? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Karate Kid. So it's just this series takeoff from the movie The Karate Kid. If okay. you remember that. So now yeah. it's these, you know the two characters. <laughs> We're talking about Cobra Kai, <laughs> the two characters that were in that movie and how now they're in their whatever late 40s with kids. And, you know, it's just the <laughs> it's an interesting. But I do believe that we are not the only ones that got uh, sucked in by by that no. series. <laughs> it's a great show. I, 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 I really like it. I'm bummed that there's only two episodes. I mean, as soon or two seasons, as soon as that second season ended for me, I was online. Like, when is the next one coming? I can't wait. And I think they've signed for, for a couple more seasons. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. I mean, I did, I, to my credit, most of it, I was, I was riding my indoor trainer um, while watching the bike trainer, but but I had my puppy on my lap for some of the time too. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Well, cool. Welcome, welcome to the show. I know you you guys do things other than um, other than watching uh, Cobra Kai. So um, why don't you tell us what what's the latest? What have you been up to? Uh, you know, what kind of background should the should the listeners uh, who don't know you uh, know? And, and what's the what's the latest in the Yukon? Go ahead. That's a big question. <laughs> um, gosh. Um, well, I guess, you know, we know you guys from our adventure racing backgrounds. And um, that's, I guess, kind of where our relationship started. Um, kind of when we started 2002 was our first adventure race came to the Yukon. And we thought, ah, how hard could that be? Right. 500 K. Yukon Wilderness, sure. <laughs> and then as uh, many adventure racing stories go, the addiction uh, began. Um, so I don't even remember when we met. I think we met. Do you guys remember uh, when I met with you and the drunk uh, guy in, she, where was it? I think it was in Mexico. Where, it was in Mexico and we got a driver to take us to a race that the 
that the race guys set up for us. And then they gave us a truck driver and he was drunker and crap. And we were scared to death because it was it was real late, remember? Like 10 o'clock at night and we're, we're hanging on to the sides and scared to death. That sounds like every race that we've done in Mexico. I think we did five of those races and they all had some kind of story like that. <laughs> some, yep. some kind of story that was outside the race that was made it more interesting yeah. sometimes than the races themselves. Um, yeah. I remember that and I remember actually meeting you at the party and the fireworks after and feeling like, wow, this is pretty cool. We're talking to uh, Mark. Nice, you know, getting a chance to meet you and, um, you know, just having followed you guys in the races and stuff. It was, we felt pretty, pretty um, pumped about that. And that was one of our first races, like kind of second, third race, maybe. Yeah, that was early on for sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah. But Mark, ultimate, like really, there's no memory that's ever going to top the Rock and Ice Ultra where you and Travis <laughs> were there. Um, and we were all in the same tent at, you know, at the end of the day. We all traveled the same distance, just at different different times. And we all got together in the same tent at minus 30. And, you know, you got this little heater and we're just, just talking stories and talking racing and listening to your stories. Of, uh, so we were just kind of, uh, yeah, to be, in that, to be in that environment, you know, in the north, so cold you know raced hard all day you get back to the tent and then for you to roll in afterward and just be as cheerful and as you know you've been out there for twice as long as us and you just roll in it's like that was, that was hard and just with a big smile on your face and just i think he was trying to you were trying to stay ahead of the terminators <laughs> yeah, that's right I think at the end, I, I beat those guys. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I forgot about the Terminators. Oh, no. I, uh, that's, they crossed in the, uh, the whoopie doos I think that's, that's right. I yep. like that's yeah, I, I took them in at the pair. I, I, I passed and right at the, in the, uh, shoot, what do you call it? In the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I passed them in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, that was that was fun. And a little little bit of background here. This is 2008. Uh, they had this. It was called the Rock and Ice Ultra, and, and it's uh, what five or six day running and snowshoeing stage race. So you pull a sled with all your mandatory gear, and the total was what maybe 200k or something, 250k. Yeah, something like, something that. like that. Yeah, I don't know. So so you're out, you know, running for many hours every day, and then. Uh, you know, when you stop, it's, it's literally, you know, 20 below zero or, or something outside. So all you can do is sit in these tents and, uh, we, we all got to spend a lot of time just joking around and, um, and having fun with it. And, you know, my wife, Amy continually makes me tell the story because, uh, Greg and Denise here were, were already married. Um, but at this time I was, planning on proposing to Amy and apparently she saw it coming but Amy wanted me to win win the prize first place you get this diamond that's worth like uh, uh well Greg knows how much it's worth <laughs> but I think it's worth <laughs> 10 or 12 probably better not to talk about the, the value now <laughs> yeah so anyway uh you know Greg and I start off and I you know I knew Greg from adventure racing and oh he's a good runner and and what it turned out not only was he super fit but man he just had the gear totally diamond dialed in and um, I was scrambling around with, with everything and just did did not uh, did I thought I had my act together for racing across the the frozen north but it turned out uh, I, I wasted a lot of time doing that not that I could have kept up with you anyway so uh, Greg and Denise both took the cake you guys won the diamonds and uh, uh, that's that's the story well Amy still married you man like, yeah, Amy did still marry me. So. <laughs> Even without yeah. it. So, you know, yeah. it's it's a win-win all the way around. <laughs> yeah, no, so it worked you, out. Then you knew Amy wasn't marrying you for the diamond. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, she wasn't in it for, for the uh, for the money. So uh, n neither of us had any money, which uh, made it simple. Um, so, uh, so that was way up in the frozen north. That was in... Uh, uh, what was it like Yellowknife Canada is that where we were yeah Yellowknife that's one of my favorite places that I've ever been in my life it was really cool there you know I've never been been up that high north you know I've been in 
in Alaska a bunch, but that yellow knife was really cool. And that guy made us made dinner for us after the race was over, you know, and that was a blast. That's right. That was the first time we had caribou. The guy had a yeah. full, full yeah. freezer full of caribou and we had those steaks. That was awesome. Yeah. That's what we say when we come to Colorado. We're like, oh, like yellow knife for us. It was like, yeah, lots of snow, lots of, lots of <laughs> <in the winter. laughs> it's just like being home only flatter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, so, so now Greg, I hear you're, you're going to the other end of the globe. Tell us about this. What's your that South pole? Like, the South Pole? You're, are you, is that what you're trying to do? How do you even know you yeah. got there? So the, you know, after those races, I did those, you know, I did the rock and ice there a couple of years in a row. And then I did the Yukon Arctic Ultra and that was, that race was 700 K um, kind of similar style, except non stage race. Right. So it's really pull your own, pull your gear. There's a check stop. So um, I've been pretty dialed into that world for, for a fairly long time. I think uh, obviously we have, you know, what seems like eight months of winter here in the Yukon. Yeah. So, it, it seems like eight, but it's really nine, right? I think it's at least 10. <laughs> this, this year, uh, this and, it, and, and when it's not winter, Greg is out hunting. Right. Pretty much. Yeah. Did you, how long did that 700 K one take? Uh, I finished that in eight days. Yep. And so, what, yeah, I think you won that one, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the whole self pole thing, it's been on my radar for, for over 10 years. And, you know, I've been, I've done, been doing a lot of different things, especially after finishing up adventure racing. Um, then I went into, you know, to television and producing the television show and, and that the business side of, of everything that we have going on. And that's consumed quite a bit of our, of our time over the last five years, especially, um, and you know, kids, a couple kids in there, you know, just, just <laughs> life, you know, you start to grow up and life and, uh, life hits you in the side of the head in different, different angles. And now we're just coming to a place where I sat down with like Denise and I sat down and I kind of told her how important it was to me to, to, you know, action this, one of these, you know, li lifetime or long-term goals. And we discussed it. And there's a lot of work. There's a lot of logistics ahead of us to be able to pull it off. But the, you know, the biggest thing is Denise is super supportive. And um, when you have a spouse that's supportive of your dreams, that it makes it a lot more attainable. And um, then it's just, you know, working together to, especially in our situation with all the businesses and with the, the kids and just kind of, it all has to come together and everybody has to be, you know, it's like an adventure racing team. You, you know, just to pull off one of these expeditions and yeah, this is, this is a solo unsupported attempt. Um, I'm not going to say attempt because I'm going to do it. So it's not going to be. What, what is it you're going to do, Greg? Yeah, uh, Mark. So the plan is to uh, snowshoe uh, solo unsupported from Hercules Inlet to the South Pole, which is uh, 700 miles. Holy shit. Wow. <laughs> So but you're yeah. going with him, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to get that guy who's still at the airport look, <laughs> looking for me. <laughs> Dad and the Terminators are coming along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's the that's the plan. It's just a matter of putting the logistics together and um, yeah, and making making it happen. You know, it's there's going to be a lot of obviously training involved but the logistics behind it are are huge it's a huge task um, okay yeah. Yeah. you know i did a hundred miler in alaska one one winter and i thought that was a big deal <laughs> that's just a walk in the park well i don't I, I think that anytime you do 100 miles or 200 miles or whatever it is it seems like a big deal at you know you, you know, a 5K can be a big deal. If you're going all out for 5K, we all know what that feels like. Like yeah. your lungs are destroyed at the end. You feel it's trash. It's too hard. That's it's... why I don't do those things. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> <me> do. <too. laughs> you're right. And yeah, I think that this is, this is, this is just, just different. It's a mindset, right? We all, in order to do the kind of racing that we've done, um, you know, all four of us, it's, it's, 
getting into a mindset that no matter what happens and what gets put in front of you, you will overcome it and you will just keep going. Yep. And that's what I have to do on the self pole. I just have to do it for under 33 days. 33 so days. The record, the record right now is 33 days. And is um, that there and back? Or do you get well, picked up at the South Pole? Yeah, you get picked up at the South Pole. So <laughs> nobody's, nobody's ever done it on snowshoes, um, solo, unsupported. So, I was going to ask why, and is that why you're thinking snowshoes instead of skis? I, I would imagine ski, I would think skis would be a little faster. Skis are absolutely faster. Yeah. And that's why nobody does it on snowshoes because it's, um, I talked to a guy that's almost done it who, you know, who does expeditions down there. And he was, he's just looking at me and going like snowshoes are like 30% harder than wow. ski. Yeah. And he's, he's trying to discourage me from doing it. Um, and like he, he knows me as well. He's just suggesting, well, man, like you might want to really consider skis. And the, you know, for me, it's not about, it's about the challenge. And yes, um, there's a record that's, that's out there and it's on snowshoes and I'm not a huge skier. So, um, you know, go with, go with your strength, even if, even if you would, even if I could finish it faster on skis, um, it would be more rewarding on foot yeah. for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. Got to do your thing. So I've been um, training for these burrow races. I think I told you guys, you like run along with the donkey on a leash. Have you thought about taking one with you, Greg? Cause they have these little hoods that, you know, <laughs> just perfect, right? dig just... through the snow. They're Those... desert animals. They're really tough. Right. Well, and the great thing is that we have two of them. So yeah, that's right. Okay. So you have your own to take. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it can't be that hard to get them down to Argentina. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I've never considered it. Trav, no. but okay. If you've, if you've got a really good one, because ours are a little fat. <laughs> oh no, these guys are fit. They're they're small, but they're they're fit. Oh, so. ours are not. But, <laughs> but you, uh, so you're gonna have all the food for a month, basically. You've got with you. Yep. So you carry everything. You know, fuel, food. You name it, everything you need to survive, everything I need to survive by myself for the whole the whole trip. Yeah. So you're gonna put that on sleds like we usually just, do? Yep, just like the Rock and Ice Ultra Mark, we're gonna have, um, I'll have a sled that I'll pull behind me. Um, I, I, I'm roughly figuring it'll be about somewhere in the 200 pound range. Oh man. Um, so yeah, it'll be just head down, just go. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Jeez, you know, I'm glad I'm glad I'm an old man, so I don't have to do that stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, Mark. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, so dad did a, um, a Wim Hof breathing session uh, the other day. You guys have probably heard of Wim yeah. Hof. Most of the listeners probably had, you know, big name in the, in, in the sort of, you know, optimization world. Um, uh, Greg, what do you think? Are you going to get into that? Like, I, my understanding is if you do enough of that, you won't even have to wear clothes on this expedition. Is that, <laughs> is that kind of what you're thinking? Or we have a guy here, a local guy that goes into one of our lakes, uh, fish, is it fish lake? Yeah, Long lake, doesn't matter. Um, he's been doing this every day all winter, and he does video of it. And it uh, personally, uh, I don't want to do that. But he yeah. gets in the cold water in the winter. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he cuts so, a hole in the ice and he's diving down there. And Well, the reality is, is you'd be better off at minus 40 here jumping in the water than you would be standing outside naked. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like for a period well, that's of time. true. The water must be warmer than the <laughs> air, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and so, Greg, is he really does not like cold water? It's like a... Um, like I tease him kind of because I'm like you climb mountains and but like if it's cold it's like oh like 
Yeah. 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 It's like, no, I'm not going in. <laughs> All right. Well, if I, if, if I don't have to go into cold water, if it's in a race or something, then, and you have to do it, then there's no issue. It's just mind over matter, right? Just like anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, are, are you guys just totally adjusted to that freezing cold outside? Does it not bother you at all? Or Mark, we've, I don't know, we've lived here for now, what, 20? Yeah, I guess it just is kind of normal, right? Like we've been here over yeah. 20 years. So um, not that we don't like warm weather, <laughs> but it's just the climate here and it's, you just kind of get used to it and you just dress for it, right? So it's, yeah. You know, and it's weird when you change from like, okay, we don't need three pairs or four pairs of pants to go for a run. Like, it's like, oh, it's only a two pair of pant day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> then you then you know it's like July. Yeah. yeah. And, then it, and then it's you know plus five Celsius, so whatever. It's like forty degrees Celsius or whatever or Fahrenheit, and you've got shorts on. It's like summertime. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. And so here, of course, for the listeners, here is, is the Yukon. Um, you, you guys uh, live up there south of uh, Whitehorse, kind of. And um, man, it's, it's an awesome place. I've been lucky enough to go up there. Dad's been up there before. So I was looking up Yukon and, and I want to give like, give the listeners some perspective. And, and it says um, the Yukon territory is 20% larger than California and the population of the Yukon is somewhere around 35,000 people. Uh, does that sound about right to you guys? Yeah, that's about right. I think yeah. we have, um, don't they say we have more moose than people? Oh, we have twice as many moose than we do people. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and it is, man, it's, it's awesome. We can, you know, maybe we'll get into, I was lucky enough to go up with um, Greg to film a couple of episodes of his TV show, Greg McHale's Wild Yukon. And, just flying across that wilderness, Greg, for, it really left a mark on me because it is just, you know, miles and miles, hours and hours you're flying along and you see nothing related to man. You know, there's like two roads in the whole territory and it's just mountains <laughs> and lakes and rivers. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. It's great to know that wild places like that still exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Yukon, it's pretty special. It's, it's, it's harsh. Like there's a, there's a reason why, you know, 35,000 people live here because the winters are long, it's dark and they're cold. Um, the short summers are amazingly beautiful. It's abundant with, you know, beautiful places and, and wild game. Um, but it's, uh, it's a tough place to live unless you, unless you really love the outdoors. Like, what is it for you yeah. that, that keeps you keeps you here? I mean, I, I think it's part of what helped us in our adventure racing career as far as the mental side of it. I wouldn't say it helped our paddling very much. <laughs> <laughs> we have such a short season and uh, we are not known to be amazing paddlers, but um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of makes you tougher, right? Like you just, you want to get outside and enjoy this beautiful country you just gotta kind of suck it up and go with the weather and like I say put more layers on but I mean really when we moved here this is when I started running like I just was something about this place that I joined a little learn to run group like I really didn't run um and then the first day out the lady's like oh like you've never really run I'm like no and then I just loved it so much, got into the trails and loved the, just the nature and being out either by yourself or with a group, but you know, the like-minded people here. Um, and it just, yeah, we came out for a summer adventure um, after university, lived here for five months. We went back to Ontario for a year and it was just like, our heart was kind of left here. It was like, we, that this is where we belong. So we kind of packed everything out up again and, Moved back out with our all our worldly possessions and <laughs> my, little, nothing. my little car, a couple kayaks and snowboards. And yeah, many years later, here we are. All right. Good well, you, you, guys. you guys certainly do live in God's com country, you know. I mean, it's a great place. And I haven't spent that much time up there. But man, it's perfect, I think. I love it. Yeah. And so, Denise, back to your running. So you said that the 5K hurts too much, but... 
weren't you on the Canadian national like hundred K team or did, did you win the, the national championship at hundred K or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I ran on the Canadian team for a few years. Um, but we did 5k loops 20 times. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's kind of like, do you want to, I always think, do you want to like close your hand and the door like once really hard or you just want to like slow, <laughs> slow <laughs> yeah. it? like a long kind of, you know, like any endurance sports. Right. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's probably why we all gravitated this way. Um, but gosh, you do do a 5k or something like that. And, and it's such a different feeling. eh? just yep. that burning oh, in yeah. your lungs and that taste of blood and <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, so I you. Like, I just like the mental state of you get past that, you know, a few hours into a run or whatever, and it just, I don't know, it's just that, you know, that prolonged feeling. You keep going, and where your mind and body takes you, and yeah, that's what I like about it. I think the endurance, something about endurance sports, and when I say endurance, um, I I I tend to lean more toward you know, big expedition type stuff, not, not a marathon and not to take anything away from marathoners. Um, but I don't think in three hours or even 10 hours that you can, that you can experience what you do in say an adventure race or a big, um, like a, like a Yukon Arctic ultra that takes you multiple days. You, you get to really, understand who you are inside and who the people around you who what they're really made of because these events tear you down like to a point where where you it's raw it's really raw and when you know denise does 100k like that's um he has the 100k record in our country but that's after years of adventure racing, years of being tore down to, you know, to the bone. And then she st said, oh, maybe I'll go out and try out for the, the 100K team. And it was just, it was a given that she was going to make the team because this is just from years of just really beating yourself down and understanding what pain is. So the um, when she got the the hundred k record in our country, it was like I already knew that that was going to happen before she even showed up to the course because she just has so much time spent um, just really digging deep, and yeah. that's what endurance athletics gives people um, or endurance sports or not even necessarily a competition, but these these things where you. Um, these events where you just get beat down to your core, which we all know them very well. Mark's been doing it forever. Um, Travis, you've been doing it for 20 some years now, I'm sure. And when you walk away from those kind of events, you, um, you find out something about yourself that you would never find anywhere else. And that's what these, these things I think have, done for us and as a couple we've been very fortunate to be able to do them together which means that um, we get to see each other at our very lowest like like Denise has seen me at, at as low as as low as I could possibly be sorry about that guys um, no worries Greg you're popular and and I've seen Denise in the same situation, right? Yeah. Trav, I don't know if I've seen you in that situation, but we've seen each other digging really deep in Brazil at the Adventure Racing that's, World Championship. That's right, yeah. Greg and I did the World Championship in Brazil together. Um, and then Denise and I, we did that Abu Dhabi race yeah. together, right? That was that was a real adventure. That was super cool. That was one of my favorite races. Yeah. yeah, me too. Running through the sand dunes. And we had some lows there. I mean, I, we had one one day I just like I lost my mind or something. Remember how lost I got us? Like it was kind of the crux of the race, like right towards the end. And we kind of we had had a really good 
like 100k run trek through yeah. the sand dunes and we we won that stage with this incredible sprint finish and we were kind of back sort of in the rankings and then the next stage was this sort of i still don't know what happened but it was this tricky navigation on this weird flat desert um landscape and remember that Denise in the dark like we were like running full speed but the other teams were coming back the other way and <laughs> I still don't know how I really messed us up there for a few hours yeah and then we got behind because there was like a um some kind of a rope there's a, a rope thing, thing. yeah we got a big line slower yep. team and that was tricky but man that that trek the day before was so epic and we because yep. we had some highs and lows on that race yeah, yeah, that that trek. One of my favorite memories from travel around the world was was we were out there in the desert, just sand dunes as far as you can see. And remember, we like crested a sand dune, and there's a mother camel and a baby that had like yeah. looked like it had just plopped down, and it's all shaky and all wet. And just seeing that in the sunrise, I mean, it was incredible. I know that was cool and something that you're just like, is this really happening right now? Yep. And then yeah, we was... had a mission to catch those teams because um, uh, John had gone down the day before with bad feet. And then I'll just remember that we caught those lead teams and that sprint to the finish. And I was attached to you <laughs> running down. Like, I didn't know my little legs could go that fast. <laughs> I would have fallen. I would still be picking sand out, I'm sure, from places. But, and really, it was only for bragging rights because we were uh -huh. like, yeah. We won the stage, the the sort of crux of the race, but by seconds. So it yeah, didn't mean it was, anything, but to us, it sure did. It was crazy. We didn't have to deal with Greg, so that kind of made it a little easier. <laughs> just, just kidding, Greg. No, Greg, Greg, Greg got to see me at a low point. It wasn't even a race. It was it was the hunting trip um, a, a few years ago when we went out and uh, it was a, a mountain caribou hunt. And, um, you know, just, for, for, you know, Greg's kind of used to this stuff. But man, for me, flying into the back country and hiking these peaks and glassing all day looking for caribou, just amazing and uh you, you know the the hope obviously is to harvest an animal and kind of bring out the um bring out the the meat and i was like almost the meat i was like for a few minutes there greg or maybe a couple days i was like the dead animal you remember that i was on the hillside wrapped in the space blanket like <laughs> i was in trouble <laughs> yeah no that's but i mean those kind of things those kind of things happen to all of us whether it's a race or whether sometimes it's in the mountains you know it just uh it's just how it goes it's it's how we deal with it, right? Like you were a trooper. You sucked it up for two days before it was finally okay. Uh, like, and I wasn't knowing you and knowing your ability to suffer. I was kind of like, well, I mean, I, I know at least that he's going to suck it up until we, he, you know, he gets better or else this is going to get real bad. And, and it, it did get to the point where we kind of figured that we got to gut down off this mountain now Otherwise, tomorrow, it might be a helicopter situation. Um, but you toughed it out and got down and we, you know, we jumped in my plane and I flew you out and we, and, you know, it was, it was, it was good. It was all good. It was part of the experience and there wasn't any caribou there anyway. So, it was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there was, there wasn't anything that we, that we saw that we were after. Let's put it that way. But yeah, but you had Jardia, no? Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, turn out, yeah, Giardia and other, I think there was Giardia and some other thing, you know, when I finally did the stool sample, um, <laughs> some other long name thing that I couldn't pronounce, but uh, yeah, you know, that's some, sometimes that happens when uh, when you're out, out in the woods and stuff. Hey, um, Trav, I want to, and we all know her, I want to talk a little bit about um, our race in Brazil. I really want to talk about uh, the female that was on our team which is Robin Benincasa, if anybody knows who, who she is. Um, she's very well known in the adventure racing world, certainly uh, in the early days, um, public speaker, motivational speaker, uh, just a great, great gal. Yep. Um, she's got a great book. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers the name, but if, if you're looking for another good motivational book, Robin's uh, book is, is excellent. So um, we raced, Trav and I raced with Robin. Denise wasn't there. Um, on Team Merrill, it was, Robin was the captain of the team, and I. What I guess I want to point out is that I've never witnessed anyone suffer 
as bad as I watched Robin suffer through that race. Now, the, the point of this is that um, not, to, not to degrade her, it's really to highlight the fact that this woman had the ability to complete the Adventure Racing World Championships in Brazil, and she suffered almost from day one. Yeah, I think coming recently off a double hip replacement, right? So that's that kind of says it right there, number one. <laughs> I, remember, I remember time when like you and I had a conversation in the middle of the course is like, are do do we need to pull the pin on this? Because are we going to permanently, you know, hurt this woman? Like, is she going to suffer from this? Because she's not gonna quit. She's yeah. never ever, yeah. ever. Like, are we gonna have to quit for her? And, yeah. um, you know, we got to the point where she actually, she kind of started to come back and get a little bit better, but um, just tough, tough woman. And this is everything that adventure racing has probably given all of us. If there's anything it's given us, it's probably the, the ability to suffer and to move forward in difficult situations. And watching Robin do that um, was at that point in my career was, was just unbelievable almost. And when you, can, when you can witness somebody digging so deep, that's an inspiration that if that doesn't drive you forward, um, then I don't know what does. And I think that people don't realize in life how capable they really are if they just use their mind and mentally focus on a goal and go after that goal. Um, because none of us are, are, are superhuman. None of us are. We are all probably fairly, you know, um, above average athletes, but generally speaking, it's in your, it's all in our mind. And when you have, you know, a group of people, like I don't get to very, talk to adventure racers very often. So, and certainly now, because there's just nobody here in the Yukon, but <laughs> when, when you get- uh, You guys don't talk to anyone. This is, this is for those, this is like the first time Greg and Denise have talked to anyone, you know, what, since the, since the snow started falling, like last, you know, July, it got warm July 4th and then it snowed again, you know, July 7th. And so, yeah, but they, they've got a lot to say. So keep just whatever comes to mind, Greg, keep it coming. No, it's, it's, it's Good. Well, that made me think of watching you guys in the <laughs> challenge um, from Fiji. Um, gosh, I was, I, well, I watched all of that running on the treadmill because it was sort of like you did with uh, Cobra Kai. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and I was glad that I was versed in running and crying because I have had experience doing that as an adventure racer. Because yep. man, watching that and just you know, you guys having that discussion about Mark, like saying like, he's like, he's never gonna stop, right? Like similar to Robin, like, mm -hmm. I think Mark, everybody knew that you were very unlikely to ever say, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, man, that was inspiring to watch. You know, when we got, uh, when we've got the, uh, movie and you know we had our whole family here watch it together you know and everything and uh halfway through the movie i see this old white guy all bent over and you know, just he can't move and, and i said to, to my family who is that guy <laughs> my wife said that that's you <laughs> that can't be me <laughs> <laughs> that can't be me because my brain was still rolling <laughs> yeah. the other the other thing we've been watching a lot around here is uh is greg's show again greg McHale's wild yukon dad i think you catched up on some on a little of that on on youtube the other day right do you remember any uh any scenes or things you were watching there dad well, I did watch it on YouTube because you told me that's the only place to get it. But I've been watching your show, Greg, since I remember we were talking on a, you were on a, 
your first episode, I think, and we talked together for a little bit, and I've been watching your show since then. So I don't know how many episodes I saw, but a whole bunch, that's for sure. It's great stuff. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah. Season five, right? Time, time flies. I always think, like, you know, other people's kids, they get, you can never believe how old they are. And, and now it's like, oh, Greg's TV show. And I keep thinking, oh, new show. And now I'm like, oh, season five. Like, man, way to go. You And, and, and you know, just following your story and being in touch with you about it throughout the years, I know how hard it is to turn something like this into, you know, something that is at all profitable. And I mean, you guys have broken through and, and you're doing it and, um, and it's awesome. So what, what should the listeners know? Like if you were to, you know, give us a quick intro to the show, we got some hunters listening, probably most people are, you know, don't want, don't watch any hunting TV. What, what should they know about it? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, really, really what the concept of the Wild Yukon was to bring in, um, you know, this adventure racing style of hunting along with the, you know, aviation and just the beauty of the Yukon, the place that we live. Like hunting is such a huge part of, of you know, survival to up in the Yukon. And it's been such a tradition. And I know that you know, down south, it's um, there's there's a lot more contention around the um, the idea of of hunting and of killing animals for food, and but it's just it's just part of obviously the indigenous culture in Canada and people in the north. The amount of the you know the amount of meat that I supply to families in uh, in the Yukon is. It, it, it's a lot and it's very important to people. So um, the idea of that, of this, you know, producing my own show um, about hunting was just to bring in all of the elements of our life and what we love to do, which is, you know, try to, you know, move through the, move through the mountains and move through the terrain by human power as much as we can. And I'm a pilot, so I love flying and just getting back into really deep places that nobody ever gets to and nobody sees um, and then producing a, producing a hunting show around it. So that's really what it was like. It was never, um, there's a lot of shows out there and there's a lot of, of styles of hunting that don't really resonate with me. And this style of hunting was one that, um, that I had not seen before. So we felt that there was, there might be an appetite for it um, within the viewership and, you know, and fitness and nutrition and all of the things that, you know, a lot of people would never associate with hunting. Um, a lot of people think that hunters are, you know, the, the, the fat guy sitting in a tree stand, um, sitting over a bait pile waiting for a deer or a bear or something to walk up and, and shoot it. And that's, um, that, that certainly, that certainly is, is part of, of hunting. Hunting is very diverse. Um, and in, in the way that we do it here in the Yukon is, is completely um, you know, a different style and a bit unique. And I really felt you know, when we started to produce it, we thought that this might be something that will resonate with people and to paint, um, really to try to paint hunters in, um, in, a, in a different light in, in ways. So, I, I like to believe we've been successful at it. You know, Denise had the opportunity this year for the first time in, in 10 years to actually come out hunting with me. And it was just such an amazing experience again, because, you know, kids and life and businesses don't necessarily allow for that. And this past year has been some challenging moments business-wise. So we were able to free up some time yeah, I mean, one of the things with COVID is I always have a race in August, um, and my race was canceled, and our tourism business was is not well. It's running on a very small scale, um, so it was the first time, like Greg said, before kids that I've gone hunting, um, and it was actually worked perfect because Greg said, um, "What kind of hunt do you want to do?" And I said, "Well, is it, can we run in?" And I drew a permit that we literally had a 70K, we left from our door here and it was a 70K run <laughs> into the base of the hunt. So 
I got what I, you know, I mean, that was kind of the adventure for me. And then it was actually also really cool to see the, cause I had never hunted with the crew, like with the film crew and to just see it from that aspect and how they work together and that different dynamic. And um, so that was, that was just really neat to have that connection to actually see more what Greg's doing when he's gone all the time. <laughs> um, and for me, like I'm not a huge hunter, but I'm gonna hunt, it's sheep hunting because you're in the mountains. It, it just is a place I wanna be. Um, so it's not as much about harvesting the animal so much as just being out there. Yeah. Oh man, great story. And yeah, I think uh, you know a couple of things come to mind. One is, like you said, Greg, there, there's a lot of different ways to do hunting. And uh, Dad and I were talking with um, Max King recently on the podcast, and Max is a, a super super top ultra runner, and he's gotten into hunting recently. And then you you have a story like yours, Denise. Uh, um, you know, I think you were successful in harvesting a, a doll sheep ram, which which in the world of hunting is, is a huge accomplishment. And for, you know, especially for most hunters from the United States, it's not an opportunity that comes about often, you know, if ever. So for you to be able to go out and do that, to have your running adventure and, and just to also do it, you know, as, as who you are, as, as an athlete, as someone who is very much health and wellness and sustainability focused, uh, you know, who uh, both of you guys are, are parents of young children like I am. It's a different picture of hunting, I think, than some people get, um, you know, and I think we, we all maybe at times have had feedback of, you know, something to the extent of like, oh, you know, you seem to be really connected with nature. How could you go out and, and go hunting? Um, what do you think? Do either of you have I don't know, a reply to that of, uh, you know, just what, what are your thoughts when you sort of hear the blanket perspective, of, you know, absolutely no hunting. You know, and if you do it, you know, you're, you're kind of a bad person or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I didn't have an answer to that, then maybe I'm in the wrong profession. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. You know, Trav, it's um, the thing about hunting that people don't often don't understand is the conservation perspective behind it. And um, it's, it's ultimately, we wouldn't have to hunt if the hunting would not, not, not all be necessary if you didn't have an overabundance of population of people. <laughs> um, so we are ultimately the problem, but hunting is, is certainly conservation by the real groups on the planet and there's a there's a, a guy that's really pushing the message, and it's his his name is um, Rob Kroger, and if you check him out, Blood Origins is his um, his Instagram. But he really dives into what hunting does for wildlife all around the planet, and ultimately, if we if we didn't hunt, the value of these animals would be so diminished. Um, that, that really we would just exterminate them. Like if there was, like if you take Africa, for instance, and I'm going a little bit out, outside of North America as, an, as a larger example, but if you didn't have conservation and, and hunters pouring millions and millions of dollars into these countries that um, have this rich wildlife, there would be no value to the wildlife and they would just be consumed by people eating. Um, and that's because that would be their food source. So now we, we have a value for animals, which is a dollar value for sure. And that really helps sustain the population for us to have conservation efforts in order to keep them. So um, if, when people believe that, you know, how do you, how can you be so connected to nature, but yet you still can go out and kill something. And um, the reality is, is that when I'm out there on the land and I'm, you know, I get to do a 70 kilometer trek with my wife and whether we kill something or we don't, that's the trophy. That's the experience. And a lot of us don't, ever even get out into nature to experience nature to enjoy that trophy so 
those people that do do that, they go, oh, well, how could you kill something? Well, taking, you know, doing the hard work is part of, of it for us. And the enjoyment of the chase, the enjoyment of putting yourself physically uh, against the elements, um, putting food on your table that you've taken by your own hands and you're now feeding to your family or to other families around you versus them going and buying, you know, chicken or pork or whatever. And we could get into the whole sustainable um, farming conversation and that, and, or factory farming. And that's just, that's just a whole beast that nobody wants to even talk about. Um, but when it comes to hunting, it's hunters are true conservationists. And I really highly recommend that if you, if you have an opinion on hunting and it's, it's not based in fact, um, it's just an opinion. I really highly recommend you maybe, maybe do a little bit of research and, um, and it might change your mind. So I love, I love hunting and it's about the pursuit. It's about the physical, you know, requirements that it takes to do it in the style that we do it. And um, I have no problem putting that meat on the table for our family. But mind you, having said that, we are a family that we eat minimal meat. We do not eat a lot of red meat. We, um, you, you said it, Travis. Well, I'll let Denise, Denise can speak way better to it than I can. Hey, yeah. Because- tell, tell us more, Denise. I've been noticing on Instagram, you got these awesome uh, vegetarian meals and pictures. And I know you're, you're doing coaching in that area. What, uh, what should we know? I know it's a little bit of a dichotomy here. <laughs> and I've had a few people saying like, because you know, they, um, there's some pictures posted of me with, with the ram that I harvested this year. And like, do we, you know, do we even eat meat? And like, my, I mean, my philosophy is just, you know, bioindividuality. So you eat what makes you feel good. Right. So it's not an ethical thing to me that I don't eat and I I do eat meat sometimes I just don't eat a lot of it I just feel better when I don't eat much of it um but the meat that we harvest gets eaten by our family and other families so it's not just I certainly don't take the light like killing something that's like that's a hard thing to do I've had I've harvested three rams and you know I'm sure maybe you felt that too Travis the first time you harvest something it is an emotional thing. Yeah. Every time it's, it's yeah. sad. It's really hard. And that's, I think some people think when they think hunting, they think killing and, you know, actually it's, it's this thing that you're putting hours and hours and months and months into, you know, and, and then the killing itself is, is, you know, a very small piece of the experience, but a sad and and powerful part. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, it really sticks with me and it also, to me, it's, it's been a, a deep sense of sort of responsibility of like, you know, any, any meat or animal product, a life is given towards that. And, and when you're the one who takes the life, I tell you what, you take it a lot more seriously and you are not, you know, wasting the meat or taking it for granted or anything like that. Cause it is hard and it, and it is sad. So yeah, sorry, go ahead. I think differently than when you just to go to the store and buy packaged meat, people don't give that any thought, but then um, may have an opinion or not on, on hunting. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, I just kind of use what I think is fairly common sense. Like I, I don't know if you've ever read The Blue Zones um, by Dan Buettner, I think. Yep. Um, so they're basically looking at the, they call them the Blue Zones, the areas um, that have the most centurions and looking at the common things that these people that live a hundred plus have in common. And most of them do eat meat other than the um, Seventh-day Adventist, but um, they just eat very minimal amounts of it. They eat it for flavoring. Um, They don't eat it the way our society eats it, that they plan the meal around, I'm gonna have a 12 ounce steak and then maybe like a couple peas on the side. So I, you know, we just think about it differently, like fill the plate with veggies. Um, we eat meat sometimes. Um, sometimes, a lot of times these guys will eat the meat and I don't just because I just feel better not eating it. Um, so I think you really, 
my body just functions better not eating da no dairy and and minimal meat um but everybody's different right like I, I mean you gotta when i'm coaching like it's meeting people where they're at i don't tell like i don't think you need to be vegan or vegetarian or you know it's finding a place that you're eating healthy most of the time and if that includes meat you just do it wisely and don't eat huge amounts of it right so that's just kind of my philosophy and I guess kind of how we've evolved and I do most of cooking in our house. So, um, <laughs> it's kind of how Greg's evolved, Yeah. but, um, I tell you when he does cook and he makes, um, sheep burgers, <laughs> these kids of ours are like, dad's cooking tonight. <laughs> and I'm like, what the heck? Like mom cooks, you know, 90% of the time, but dad's the big hero. <laughs> 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 um, but they enjoy it, right? So we eat it sometimes and we don't eat it. You know, it's just kind of a moderation thing. I think ultimately for us, it's just, it's, we eat, we eat for the machine. It's about, it's about feeding the body, which we look at as this is a machine. You put great things into the machine. You're going to get great things out. And um, we didn't come into that. Uh, we came into that, uh, you know, in the last maybe, I don't know, 10 years or so more toward, but it's, um, I wish we had started earlier because I do know that the, I feel better when I don't consume a lot of meat and like, I'm just, whether it's brain function, body function, just everything you put good food, good, whole, natural food, the kind of food that, you know, Denise, Denise often says, the kind of food that your grandparents would recognize, right? Like this is like, we, there's so much food out there now that we, you, well, you can't read the package number one and you wouldn't recognize what it, what it actually was it was sitting on your plate. So that's why Denise just builds, she's built a, you know, she's built a plan around our, our family that is just good whole food um, with minimal red meat. Um, and the only meat that we do eat in our house is the stuff that, um, that we've taken. Yep. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, wh whether it's diet or lifestyle or anything else, it's never too late to start the day over. You know, you, you may, maybe someone out there, maybe you've been eating like crap for, you know, whatever, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you can still make a difference, you know? And that's something that dad and I have talked about a lot recently with, with my mom and other people we've had on the podcast talking about uh, things like the mind diet, you know, which is a kind of a specific whole foods diet that's been shown to maybe make some difference in uh, staving off and or slowing Alzheimer's. And, um, you know, you can still, you can still make a difference. You know, you, we all have habits, some of them positive and some of them negative, and uh, we can change them if we, if we want to, you know, and it's, it's not, changing those habits, I think is much easier said than done. And maybe that's where someone like Denise comes in. Um, you know, Denise, with your coaching, is it a full kind of, is it holistic wellness? Is it diet focused? Is it exercise? What, what do you do with your clients? Yeah, it's kind of all of that. Um, it's really um, client led. So we look at um, like the first meeting, we look at what we call the circle of life. So when I used to do fitness and health stuff, it was really just food and exercise and we didn't really do much of the other stuff, right? So now when I sit with people, we look at um, everything from their home environment to their social relationships, uh, to their work, to their career, um, because it doesn't matter if you're eating you know, kale and smoothies every day, if you are in like a toxic relationship you won't be healthy, you know? So it's, um, I love that it really, you know, people can come in for one thing. They think a lot of people are just kind of thinking fitness, food, I want to lose weight. And then, um, you know, you get into a whole other, other side of things. Um, so it's really kind of led by the client and what they want to work on and setting small goals. Um, it's not about whatever perfection is right like usually they'll leave with two or three things to do um that they've kind of figured that they can implement in their life and it might be as simple as like okay this week i'm gonna start every day with a glass of water 
you know, I'm going to walk 20 minutes every day. Like these aren't major, you don't need to run ultra marathons if that's not your deal. Like it's probably not the healthiest thing to do <laughs> really <laughs> anyways. Um, but really just about meeting them where they're at and making small changes that make a difference for their whole life. And that's the only way to make change. Like you can't quit smoking, stop drinking, exercise, like all that in one go. Like people are not going to be successful if it's, if it's too much. And that's why, you know, usually I'll see people for six months or so because we all have setbacks, right? So what happens is people are super motivated. They're all gung ho. And then the reality of life, their kids get sick. There's a vacation or a holiday. They get kind of thrown off track and then you know, they, they fail and then it starts this whole cycle of what they think is a failure. So yeah, really just meeting people with where they're at and, and, uh, making small steps. Yeah. Nice. I like it, Denise. I, I think that, uh, yeah, failure is part of the deal. I think we all know that well, and, and, and you have to be somewhat okay with that. And I also, I like that holistic approach because, um, you know, if you're thinking about some magic supplement or something that hopefully it's going to help you, like it's probably not going to be that big of a difference if you're only sleeping three hours a night, or, you know, if you're always super duper stressed by, you know, work or, or something else. So, you know, start, start, like you said, you, you got to have the mental health, you got to have exercise, got to have hopefully some healthy food coming in and then you sort of take it from there. So you're, like we said, you're probably coaching already every single person who lives in the Yukon, um, which is a pretty small client load. And I'm guessing you take, you must be taking like remote clients as well. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great thing about, as you know, with coaching now, especially now that um, it's easy to see people from everywhere. Um, and that's kind of what has led to this evolution actually with COVID of Greg and I producing this new program that we started on. It's kind of given us more time. And then he's kind of brought me in with my health coaching stuff to create this new program we're doing, uh, which we're calling Power Hunters. So it's kind of taking Greg's love of hunting and our love of the outdoors together and all those pieces um, and building a, a program it's targeted towards hunters um, specifically right now we're focusing on, but um, yeah, looking at it more from a broader perspective than just fitness. Nice. I like it. T tell us more. So Power Hunters, I think it's coming out. Uh, we're going to try to release this podcast the same day Power Hunters comes out. Um, what What is it? Is it an app? Is it a video series? Is it a online course? Like what, what what's in Power Hunter? Like, let's say we got dad here who wants to be a Power Hunter. Um, what What is it? Sell, sell, sell them on the program. Dad, what do you think? Are you thinking about purchasing it if they sell it to you good enough? <laughs> I actually watched it, I think, last night. <laughs> and I didn't, you know, it's great. It's really good. So you I, might have seen um, one of the, uh, maybe a, a commercial of it or something. Um, yeah, so it's a 28 day program. And um, we've got three videos, um, exercise videos. So it's me leading Greg through the videos, which has been super fun to <laughs> coach him. Um, so people can follow along with exercise videos on the app. Um, and then it's like a, a four week nutrition program and it's super like pretty simple. Tried to keep it pretty basic meals that you don't need to be a big chef or anything really kind of regular food. Um, and then the shopping lists and kind of all the preparation instructions. Um, and then Greg's done a lot of stuff on mindset. So it's got sort of the food, um, the exercise and then the mindset piece to it. So there's some motivational kind of videos um and then we'll have a facebook group that gives a chance for people to come in and ask quite like if they want to talk fitness and nutrition or i suspect there'll be a lot of people just want to talk hunting stuff um so it's a group for people to kind of come in and ask questions and and uh yeah so we're super excited about that See, i think the concept behind it was we you know when we we're really when denise has been in the field of trying to help people for a long time and um, I, I not so much, um, 
But really? now you're trying to help people, Greg. I've noticed because I'm tracking your stuff. Greg said a change in tone. You know, I don't know if you call it maturation or what, but I can tell, Greg, like you, you're truly interested in, in helping people through the hunting stuff, through the videos you're teaching. You got this education. Um, it's it's good. So continue. No, I would say you're right, Trav. In maturation is, you know, sometimes it takes people longer to grow up than others, and. I'm one a, a <laughs> slow learner my whole life. I failed grade <laughs> one, Travis. So, um, you know, pushing toward 50 years old, it's uh, it's been a long time coming, I guess. Denise has Denise has had to bear with uh, bear with it for a lot of years. Um, but but yeah, it, like kind of, I guess Denise is teaching me in a in subconsciously that uh, Greg, maybe it's time that you you know you give back and you really. Um, you really, I've, I've been, I've been so fortunate to, to have, you know, come to where we are now, um, had so many opportunities, so many great opportunities, uh, and I've been very selfish along the way as well. And, um, you know, taking a lot of time away from the family, not that I still don't, um, because, because by virtue of the job that, that we, we have created, I do spend a lot of time away during hunting season and um, certainly with the South Pole expedition. So I, um, I think it's very important to have your own personal goals and Denise has her own personal goals and to support each other through those, through those personal goals is how to create a great um, marriage and long lasting marriage, I think. Um, and I think we're very fortunate to have, uh, to have a great marriage. So, but the whole, yeah, getting getting back and giving back to people um, is is kind of my passion now. It's where I've where I've evolved to, and Denise has always she's been there, and now together to be able to do it together, and certainly to a hunting community that uh, a lot of people would consider unhealthy. Um, and I think that you know we are we've put together a program that. Often you'll get a workout program from, from someone. Often you can get a nutrition program and, you know, you can go online and find motivation, but where does, where can all of these things be brought together? And that's what we wanted to, you know, to try to put together something that is different to something that brings all of the components of our lives and, and the maturation of it from the adventure racing mindset to the nutrition knowledge to the hunting knowledge and uh, and the fitness side so we really worked hard over the last year to put together what we think is uh is is a great program and then we think that you know if um if you all work together really hard that it, people can really obtain great value from and that's yeah. um, that's our goal is to give back yeah Awesome. I think it sounds great. And I, I tell you what, just from, you know, the perspective of someone here in the U S I think there's a lot of hunters who are, are going to do, you know, maybe what's sort of a once in a lifetime trip. And it could be going to the Yukon where you guys live and or Alaska maybe and doing a guided hunt in the mountains for sheep or goat or, or caribou, uh, or maybe coming to Colorado where, where I live and doing either a guided or, or an unguided hunt, you know, probably for elk or deer. And in either of those situations, you know, you're going to find yourself in a tough mountain environment. And if, especially if you're coming to Colorado, you're very likely going to be above 8,000 feet and more likely, you know, 10 or 12,000 feet. And I think a lot of people, they put all this, you know, <laughs> this time and money into the experience and, and, and maybe they're buying all the expensive stuff, but, but they're not preparing their own body as it needs to be ready. And I can tell you what, you know, from my experience deer and elk hunting here in Colorado, if you are fit and you can move through the hills a bit better, and a lot of it is cardio, cardiovascular fitness, you're going to have so much of a better time and you'll have such a greater chance of success. And I think that's true, you know, in the Yukon and Alaska, the altitude isn't quite as high, but the conditions are, you know, probably tougher. Yeah. No, you, you hit it on the, on the head for sure. And the thing about the program that yes, it's called the Power Hunter program, and the the intent is to also you know is the evolution will be to build a program that is not you know hunter, 
um, and to, you know, because obviously that word in itself is, uh, is one that, you know, just shrinks down, shrinks down the, the ability of people to be interested in it. Um, but yeah, the program is one that you could take, you know, take the hunter out of it and everybody in, in the planet could benefit from it. It's, yeah, it could be power hiker. It could be power runner. I mean, I, mean, I think any of, uh, I don't know about the, the, I guess everyone in the Yukon was already out there doing things outside before the pandemic, but, you know, here in, in Colorado, for example, I mean, just more and more people getting outside, which, which is great, but it also, there's a lot of people doing it unprepared and you have things like avalanche accidents and, you know, lightning accidents and what have you. So I know you guys aren't teaching that stuff, but this is one step into just being prepared to go outside and take on your challenges. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And we're trying to also push it that, um, that you're doing it as a family mm. um, because, you know, keeping the meal simple that I think it's not about cooking, you know, two different meals that you're not on a diet or a plan per se that it's more just eating healthy, that everybody in the family is hopefully eating the same thing to make life easier. So I'm hopeful, like I've done it, the food plan in a way that it's for two people. Um, if you have a family, then you just kind of, you know, modify it. But um, because I think like everything, you need that support at home. Um, so if you can do it together, it's just so much easier. Cool. I like it. Count, count us in. How, how, how do, how do we find it? Is it, you got a website up or is it on the TV yeah, show just, or? Uh, yeah, it's powerhunterfitness.com uh, is the, is the site. You can just go there and, and learn all about it. Um, otherwise, you know, there's Greg McHale's Wild Yukon uh, also is a website that uh, is more hunting specific. Um, but yeah, as far as the, the program goes, powerhunterfitness.com will uh, will get you there and probably hopefully give you all the information you need and if and if it doesn't then we are completely open to answering any questions whether it's instagram facebook um just dm us at uh, everything is greg McHale's wild yukon you can just dm us and ask us anything and nice. we'll be more than happy to get back to you cool i like it yeah, so DM uh, direct message uh, for those who aren't big time Instagrammers. Uh, Dad's on Instagram, right, Dad? You most of your communication these days yeah. is DMs on Instagram, Dad. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of followers for somebody that doesn't know about Instagram. Mark. You know, I, I do, and I have no idea how they got there and why they're there. <laughs> why would anybody want to follow me? I, I can tell you the answer to that then, Mark. They got there because of a race you just did. And why they're there is because you're a superstar. That's why. <laughs> just an old guy. Nothing it's more than an old guy. guy. Mark, it's inspiring. Like, I, I know that that's what, you, that's what you think. You are not just an old guy. You are an inspiration to millions of people on this planet. Anybody who has ever watched the the uh, the Eco Challenge, um, the the latest one, or even the early ones that ever ever followed you, but certainly the latest one, you were an absolute inspiration to young and old alike of what the human mind and the human body can do. So, when you say you're that just an old guy, you you are just one of a kind of an old guy. <laughs> well, thank you. That's nice of you to say that. And I appreciate it. And you guys are the best, you know. Are you guys going to come down to Leadville next year? Or? Man, I, I don't sure, even know if we're getting out of our country I next year. <laughs> I, sure, I sure love to come back and run that again. I just, um, the, well, when I ran it, uh, well, I guess we went on two years ago this summer. Um, I enjoyed the experience, but it wasn't, you know, the race didn't go how I would have liked. So I remember saying to Greg on the way home, I got to go back. That was not, <laughs> that was not what the performance I wanted. Um, probably train a little bit differently, but just such a great area you guys live in. Yeah. Um, but for us, us guys at uh, very limited um, 
elevation, you definitely do notice that when you're coming from, I think we're at like two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you definitely notice that over hundred miles or so. <laughs> yeah. Leadville, well, Leadville is tough. The whole thing's above 10,000 feet. And, and even, yeah. you know, where I live in Salida now, which is just a little South of Leadville, we're at 7,000 feet. And th that difference when you get above 10, um, it's huge. I mean, uh, like if I'm going to race at 10,000, I got, you, I got to do a bunch of training above 10. So it, it does, it makes for a really super dynamic, um, challenge. And, and, uh, yeah, you guys had a whirlwind adventure. The Mikhail's come flying in and, you know, we picked you up at the airport and, and Greg flew to Denver and immediately he rented a car and like drove to Kansas to get some random hunting item from a sponsor, uh, the wrong direction. And, and then, then we did the race and that was, that was a good adventure. Remember that Denise, how cold it was. I mean, that night was just freezing all night long. And then, uh, Greg and I were out there on the course with Denise having the adventure. Um, and, and then on the way home, have you there and knowing up like you, I think we had every piece of clothing we had brought with us. Oh, and we were totally, on too, I think. yeah. Oh, we were all bundled. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, if anyone listening to this is thinking about doing the Leadville 100, it, you know, it usually, it starts out freezing cold and, th and then it's like, it's really comfortable for like 20 minutes and then it gets really hot <laughs> and then it snows and then it's really, really cold all night long. So um, <laughs> that's kind of, that's a typical uh, day there. But then uh, right after the race, you guys headed back home and on the way, your family expanded right give us the update who who joined your family why okay everyone's greg's rubbing his face greg tell us come on oh come on man <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love it I, I love the way you start this whole thing off and then you uh you bring up the because you did mention the never-ending puppy which i, I was like forever puppies oh <laughs> okay forever puppies so so yes we have this tourism business and dog sled uh tours are part of part of this business in the summertime and everybody loves puppies so the management of decided that we were going to get he's taking no part in this decision <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. I, you're the management greg <laughs> <laughs> decided that we were going to get two of these forever puppies which what are they actually called they're called palm skeets okay so it's a pomeranian i can't even bring myself to say the word actually <laughs> it's a pomeranian <laughs> husky cross so if you can imagine that um because tourists come and they are people are crazy with puppies and we don't want to just breed puppies for the sake of breeding puppies for hundreds and thousands of people to mall so and it's challenging like just to plan puppies and that's a whole other story so we thought we'd get these forever puppies so after running the 100 miles tracking around the airport we had to meet the um kennel owner to pick up the <laughs> and Nala are their names and we got these little baskets and I think she had given them some um aromatherapy because they were super <laughs> chill <laughs> And then as soon as we get through, she leaves and they start barking. <laughs> and then we have to, you know, when you go through security with small kids, you got to take them out of the, out of their strollers and all that. Well, they made us pick, take the dogs out of their little kennels. And Nala had thrown up all over. <laughs> and Greg, I, mean, I can hardly walk, right? And Greg's like, you can't hear us. <laughs> I'm not taking her. So I can't even walk. We got puppies. We got puke all over me. And then we get through security. We got a gun that we're trying to come across the border with. Oh, and then we <laughs> then we got to take her to the bathroom. And I'm watching Greg in the sink in the family room washing her feet. And I, and I took a picture. <laughs> this this is something that I I. I <laughs> completely blocked out of my mind so thank you travis for for bringing back the trauma um. anyways long story short we got upgraded to first class because of course we get these dogs on the plane under our seats and they just start barking and everybody around i'm sure hates us so they moved us up because the plane was half it you really don't remember any of no, this no i'm literally I'm trying to block it out <laughs> <laughs> we got moved because we were obviously fairly annoying with our little pups. So it's hard got, to imagine they moved us to first class. Yeah, though. to get everybody else away from everybody else. So 
Well, there you go. So if you want to get into first class, that's uh, that's how you do it. And um, and if you want to see the forever puppies, um, Caribou Crossing is is the business place. And, and it really is super cool because uh, when I was a kid, um, dad took a sabbatical from work for a summer and we drove up. Remember, dad got the Airstream, uh, the whole family drove up there and you guys didn't own this place then, but uh, it existed. And I swear that we went there. Um, it's, it's this cool tourism place and there's these, these, uh, fake doll sheep up on the hill. And I remember seeing those as a, as a kid, they look like the real thing. And, uh, but that's where you can pet the forever puppies. It's a cool place to, to go. Um, and, and many, I think, I think those doll sheep on the hill are the most photographed doll yeah. sheep on the planet. Yeah, I think they are. <laughs> they yeah. just happen to be fake. Yeah. And if you do want to travel first class, I think it would be cheaper to just buy the ticket and not buy the forever puppies. That's right. That's right. Those things are, that, that's the other thing Greg loves about them is the price tag, right, Craig? Minor puppies are, are not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and what is, is Caribou Crossing? I mean, do we know, are things looking good for the summer? I know a lot of the business is cruises that um, stop in Alaska and then people take the bus up or does it look like things are back on or are we kind of waiting to see? No, definitely things are not back on. Um, you know, we're in that situation. Our country is not going to allow anybody, anybody in the border is probably going to be the last thing. And obviously cruise ship traffic is, uh, was the first hit and it will probably be the, the longest hit um, on, on tourism side. So um, yeah, we're, we're looking toward uh, 2022 as a, a reopening. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be almost three years by the time it, uh, it turns around uh, for that business. But yeah, I mean, that's yeah. tough. Hey, that's yeah. I mean, certainly it, it's uh, from a business perspective, it, it's, it is difficult, but I mean, life throws curveballs at you and you, you either uh, rise to the occasion or mm -hmm. you, or you fold up shop and you, <laughs> and you sulk about it and, there's, there's nothing that we can do. There's nothing. And the, I guess, you know, the, the good thing about, about owning a business that um, goes, you know, is, is certainly devastated is if it's not because, because you did anything wrong. So there's something that you can, you can always take away from, from that knowing, well, it's one thing if I failed and the business failed, but it's one thing if the bit, if, you know, there, there's devastation that's going on and it's not because of you. So, I mean, we look at every day as, you know what, it'll, it'll come back when it comes back. And in the meantime, um, we're just having a blast doing, uh, doing what we're doing. And Denise and I get to spend so much time together and uh, we get to spend so much time with the kids, um, but we're as busy as we ever have been and things are great. Life is great. Good. Good for you guys. Has uh, in the U.S. there's been a couple rounds of this the the PPP pay paycheck protection program for small businesses where you know companies can apply for loans that probably will be forgiven. Has Canada done things like that or? Um, yeah, Denise knows way more than she's. Uh, she's I spent all a things. lot of time. Yeah. Doing Denise that. does the paperwork. That's probably good. Yeah, that's definitely yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot of paperwork. Um, no, that I mean, especially Yukon has been good. So um, we've got some help that way. Um, and our business is, um, I think, the largest tourism business. In the territory. Yeah. In the territory. Is it? So okay. We're yep. a major hub of the Southern Lakes. So it's not good, you know, if we um, shut down Holland America, the cruise ships wouldn't come into that whole corridor. So um, we've been very fortunate that way. Um, and we are open weekends in the summer for locals. Um, so out of that, you know, we actually have a lot of local people that were like, we just thought it was a cruise ship place. Um, mm. So uh, I think that business will expand once we get back running again. And I think if one thing is we'll all be feeling so much uh, more gratitude, you know, to what we had um because we were just so flat out with that business and we we almost had more business than you could handle sometimes um and you just get used to that um we didn't have to really do a lot of marketing and now we're learning how to do some of those things that we don't particularly 
excel at maybe or want to do and we're kind of forced to learn them so that's never a bad thing either i yeah. i look at this i look at this situation that we're all in um some some people some businesses are, are thriving because of it some are completely devastated and you know everybody is annoyed by the fact that um you know there are restrictions and limitations on our life right now um but I, I know, and I, and I really felt this right from the start, that this was going to be an opportunity for us to look at life differently and to grow from this. Because um, most people would just, would just look at our situation and go, wow, they lost 97% of their income in overnight. And, um, but what it's done is it's just, it's just been a, a real opportunity to, like Denise said, to learn and to expand and to try to try to just be better at things that we, things that we didn't know. And we've spent so much time educating ourselves on, um, you know, on just different aspects of business that at the end of it, we're going to come out of this and five years from now, we'll be twice as strong as we were before. And I think that if people can look at, you know, look at life like that. When you get thrown, you know, you get thrown a curveball or you fall down. It's about getting back up and just correcting the course correction and doing what you got to do to move forward. And that's the re that's the resilience of of humanity. And we're all going through that to a, to a degree. Um, and we are just going to come out of this, I believe, just just better and more grateful. Like, like Denise pointed out, just more grateful for what we have and what we had and look at life a little bit. Uh, we certainly look at life differently. And it's- well, I'm just grateful. Like, I mean, I look at other places. Our kids are going to school. Um, they're doing sports. You know, like we, as far as living in the Yukon, having so few people, we, our borders have been closed. Um, so, Certainly it's not that we haven't been affected by it, um, but at least those things as far as school and we were out last year from spring break for the rest of the year. But I mean, Ontario, and like so many places in, in Canada, there's no, they're, they're homeschooling and that's hard on everybody. Like it's hard on the kids. I worry about their education. I worry about the parents' sanity, like the whole, <laughs> um, doing that for a few months last year is like, wow, this is, yeah oh, little respect for teachers this is yep <laughs> oh yeah easy. yeah yeah well good good stuff for you guys and, and i do know i i remember greg you know i guess a, just a little over a year ago as the you know pandemic was starting i remember talking to you on the phone and, and you were saying that same kind of stuff and i think that that's you know it's part of your mindset and whether whether that's natural or something that's been cultivated through the you know sort of training and racing and challenges or, you know, probably a little bit of both. I think it's a, it's a great perspective and, you know, looking for those opportunities, uh, amidst hardship and, um, you know, and, and you guys are doing great things, you know, such as the, the new program that you created, you know, who knows, you may have not, not, not had the bandwidth to, uh, create that w without, um, you know, the slowdown with the tourism. No, I think a way to go. I think 100%, Trav, we wouldn't have had that opportunity um, because we, we were, you know, we were super busy. But this, this has provided the, a chance for us to build that program, which will ultimately affect people's lives in a really positive way. And that's, that's, what, we're, um, that's what we're really trying to do. And that's why we're getting so much gratification by just, by just doing that and pushing through. Yeah. Excellent. Nice. Well, uh, dad, what do you think? Any other questions for Greg and Denise or thoughts or anything? No, I don't have any questions, but I got to tell you, it's great seeing you guys, you know, and I hope to get up to your neck of the woods someday or have you guys back down here. And, uh, you guys are great people and I'm sure you're good business people and, Man, you're the best. So thank you very much for coming here today. Oh, thank you. It's so good to see you guys both. And 
yeah, we'd love to have you guys up anytime. And I definitely have some more running to do down your way, um, whether it's a race or just exploring too, that would be great. So we got to get together when the world opens up a little bit more. So I, I think that- Let's do it. One of the things that we really, really got to see last time we were down in Colorado was, um, yes, it's always good to see you two, you two guys, but we got to meet, um, we got to meet Pam. We got to meet uh, some extended, the the more the the larger Macy family. Well, we finally met Amy. <laughs> we finally met Amy in person. <laughs> That's and, right. Uh, I yeah. And, and, After and like twenty kid, years, huh? And, you know, really, um, Mark. Uh, hats off to you and you know and Pam you guys have really built uh, you know a great family in in Travis and and what uh, you know his family is wonderful people and you can just see that the the love and the energy that your family has is a is an amazing model for for people out there and um, yeah if um, it's you guys are inspirational so Thank you very much for allowing us to come on here, Trav, and just see you guys again. Um, anytime you're welcome in the Yukon. And whenever we're back in Colorado, we will definitely come and see you guys. Nice. Well, right. thanks guys. Right, right back at you. And, uh, you know, likewise, fa family is what it's all about. And if, if you check out a, uh, Greg's hunting show. There's some awesome episodes with his dad on there. Um, I know that you took your son and your dad out together on a hunt. Is that one on TV right now or which, which season is that? That'll come on this, uh, this fall. So okay. we're on, on the sportsman season. channel yeah. still. Yep. Yeah. So that was a bit, uh, certainly a highlight was to, it was a bucket list thing to be able to hunt with my son and my father and, you know, my dad, oh. uh, my dad's 74 and, um yeah just to get both of them out on a on a sheep hunt was was pretty amazing so <laughs> we i trav you and i have some something you know very special that a lot of people don't have and i i know for a fact that you don't take it for granted and um and i don't take it for granted the fact that we have parents that uh that can still do these kind of things um physically and just have the ability to spend time with uh, with the family out in these wild places doing um, doing activities that uh, that not a lot of people get to do. So yeah, I'm very grateful for it, and I certainly know you are. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks again. Sure appreciate it. Um, keep in touch, and uh, yeah, we'll catch you when the borders open up, huh? Sounds good, <laughs> Sounds guys. Good. Take care. All righty. See you. Have a good day. See you, guys. <laughs>